This is the Art of Darkness podcast with Kevin Kautzman and Brad Kelly. We're a couple of very online writers interested in the dark side of what drives creative people to create against all odds. This show is about art and the people who make it, what it costs them, and what it takes to bring something unique and impactful into the world. Each episode, we excavate the life and work of an artist you might think you know. Don't worry, they're all safely dead. On every episode, we try and find out just what the hell was wrong with them and how they worked through their darkness to create something that lives on after them and continues to move culture. Find us online at artofdarkpod.com and on Twitter at artofdarkpod. Darkness, Brad Kelly, Kevin Kautzman, season four well underway. Kevin, how are you doing? Never better, Brad. Excellent. Excellent. Having a great That's time. Like life is yeah. life is fantastic. We're in the middle of a crazy crypto bull run. Yeah. And for, for That's what I hear. Very, yeah. Very exciting yeah. times in, in crypto. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it's, it's Lent. Lent is yeah. Lenting. Oh, yeah. We're Lenting. It's almost yeah. Easter. Uh, yeah. So I'm very excited for that. And uh, okay. I know you okay. have a, a very hotly anticipated episode uh, yeah. that you're bringing to us. Yeah. What, yeah, do you you got? Know, what do you got for us today, Brad? Are we going south, aren't we? We're going south. We're staying south because the last episode I did uh, that I was at the helm of was uh, Robert E. Howard. So that's Texas. This is going to be Georgia. Um, uh, we're talking about Flannery O'Connor. And interestingly enough, and this isn't the first time this has happened, you know, I start throwing together research for this and, oh, lo and behold, like a major biopic is due out in like a month. What? Literally, yeah. Yeah. No, no, uh, no planning on my part at all. It's just coincidental. Ethan I- Hawk is written and directed it. His daughter, Maya Hawk stars as Flannery O'Connor. I haven't seen it cause it's not, I don't think it's out to general audiences yet, but Ethan um, Maya come on the pod. This is an Come open invitation. Pod. If anybody knows uh, these folks, uh, yeah. have them on. Artofdarkpod well, at gmail.com. And I'm quite serious. We want to talk to people about I'd, this I'd stuff. love to talk to them. Yeah. I listened to uh, an interview that they did with Bishop Barron. People may know who Bishop Barron is about this movie and about Flannery O'Connor. And they were, I, I, again, I can't speak to the film because I haven't seen it, but I can tell from what I know about Flannery and what, what I got from this interview that they, it's in good hands. Maybe it doesn't mm. end up being a great film. I, who knows? But they mm. are th- they thought about it very, very carefully. And so I'm actually pretty excited to see it. And it sounds like just, they're taking some creative chances in a, bi- in, in a biopic. That's always cool to see. So, uh, And my current favorite film is a biopic about Paul Muadib. Yeah, uh, that's right. <laughs> d- yeah. I hope, that, I hope that they call it Flan. The Flannery Flan. O'Connor. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just big bold letters. It, see, right. it's so interesting because biopics can be real rough, but they can also be incredible. Like mm-hmm. uh Capote, one of my favorite movies. Capote's one of my good. favorite yeah. films. Yeah. Is that real is it a biopic? It kind of is. It's like a very particular time in his life. And yeah, mm-hmm. great, great, mm-hmm. great. Well, yeah, and yeah. I was just I was talking to you uh before we started recording about how much I like the Wu Tang series too. Right, Two. which took me by surprise, but I'm going to check it out now because yeah, I'm, you a, I'm check a Wu-Tang, it out. Wu-Tang fan, which reminds mm-hmm. me, I think ODB has to be on the list for a future episode. Oh, sure. yeah, we got to do that. Yeah, for sure. That would, cool. uh, that, that would be a Brad <laughs> episode, I think. And of course, yeah. that's the shtick. That is our thing mm-hmm. on Art of Darkness. You take a subject, I take a subject, we go back and forth. And here, here we are. This is a core episode, and I'm really, really excited. So yeah. Where do you want to start? It's going to be a good one. Well, we'll start with the opening question. It's a little bit of a cheat because we already did our bookends book club uh meeting on Flannery O'Connor's wise blood so you might know a little bit yeah I, I don't know you know something about her anyway but Kevin what do you know about Flannery O'Connor yeah I know woefully little what I do know partly out of like chosen ing- ignorance here now because I know we were going to do her as a subject so once I once we make that decision if I, if I don't know a lot about somebody I don't Try to pretend that I do. Yeah, that's, I, uh, I, mean, I do the same thing. I like shut down. I was just like, <laughs> don't right. can do it at all. Like I'm gonna yeah, try to go and do it knowing what I know right now. Yeah, yeah it's it's more fun and honest that way. Uh, yeah. yeah, I know she wrote Wise Blood, which we mm-hmm. did for the bookends book club for our patrons. We had a lot of mm-hmm. fun doing that. Uh, so that obviously leads me to believe she's a Southern author. You mentioned mm-hmm. Georgia. Uh, I believe she was a Catholic. The mm-hmm. one true faith, mm-hmm. uh, but obviously of the South. So a Catholic in the South is going to have its own 
piquant flavor. You're living mm-hmm. uh, among the Baptists and mm-hmm. and all the rest of it. So very curious what her relationship to religion is. Um, I know she's a beloved American author and mm-hmm. uh, sort of associated with like a darkly comic Southern Gothic sensibility. Mm-hmm. She could write some bangers too, like on a sentence mm-hmm. level, reading Wise Blood as it picks up steam it takes on the quality of almost uh, a parable. Mm-hmm. Uh, so that is what I know about old Flan. Okay. Yeah, that's that's all that's all right or close enough for what we're, we're about to do. Um, I'm going to start with uh, a passage um, from, I have the collected Flannery O'Connor, which I recommend anybody picking up. I think I bought this. We're in the age of the used online bookstore, which by the way, if you go to our website, you can click on the... Uh, uh, support link and then click on the Alibri link and you can buy used books and we get a few pennies per dollar and doesn't cost you anything else and then you you get a book and you support a uh, support a, a small bookstore around the around the country um but uh, this is basically this is a little volume right here is basically everything she wrote uh and this is a lot of it is letters frankly and some of it is transcribed lectures she gave so when we're talking about the actual like prose that she put out for publication it's something like two thirds of this. I'm going to read um, from a uh, from the violent Barrett away, which is her second novel. Just a little bit. Just I, I want to get Flannery Flannery style in here. I'm going to try not not going into a southern fake southern drawl because uh, I can't really do it. But once you start reading this stuff, you start leaning into that, at least in your head a little bit. It has that it has that that vibe and that cadence to it. Um, yeah, we're not a show that does funny voices and does a little no. tap dance, song and dance number. You're going to come away from an Art of Darkness core episode knowing a lot more about somebody, though. And we have some yeah. fun. We yeah. laugh so we don't cry, that as is, we that say. Is, that is true. <clears throat> so this is from The Violent Bear It Away. And we're going to talk a lot about this this book later. I just, I'm just going to tee it up, and then we'll get into, into the bio. <clears throat> Quote, Francis Marion Tarwater's uncle had been dead for only half a day when the boy got too drunk to finish digging his grave, and a Negro named Buford Munson, who had come to get a jug filled, had to finish it and drag the body from the breakfast table where it was still sitting and bury it in a decent and Christian way with the sign of its savior at the head of the grave and enough dirt on top to keep the dogs from digging it up. Buford had come along, but about noon, and when he left at sundown, the boy, Tarwater, had never returned from the still. The old man had been Tarwater's great uncle, or said he was, and they had always lived together so far as the child knew. His uncle had said he was 70 years of age at the time he had rescued and undertaken to bring him up. He was 84 when he died. Tarwater figured this made his own age about 14. His uncle had taught him figures, reading, writing, and history, beginning with Adam expelled from the garden and going on down through the presidents to Herbert Hoover and on in speculation toward the second coming and the day of judgment. Besides giving him a good education, he had rescued him from his only other connection, old Tarwater's nephew, a school teacher who had not a child of his own at, at the time and wanted this one of his dead sisters to raise according to his own ideas. The old man was in a position to know what his ideas were. He had lived for three months in the nephew's house and what he had thought at the time was charity, but what he, what he said he had found out was not charity or anything like it. All the time he had lived there, the nephew had secretly been making a study of him. The nephew, who had taken him in, in under the name of charity, had at the same time been creeping into his soul by the back door, asking him questions that meant more than one thing, planting traps around the house and watching him fall into them, and finally coming up with a written study of him for a school teacher magazine. The stench of his behavior had reached heaven, and the Lord himself had rescued the old man. He had sent him a rage of vision. He had told him to fly with the orphan boy to the farthest part of the backwoods and raise him up to justify his redemption. The Lord had assured him a long life, and he had snatched the baby from under the schoolteacher's nose and taken him to live in the clearing, Outerhead, that he had a title to for his lifetime. The old man, who said he was a prophet, had raised the boy to expect the Lord's call himself and to be prepared for the day he would hear it. He had schooled him in the evils that befall prophets and those that come from the world, which are trifling, and those that come from the Lord and burn the prophet clean, for he himself had been burned clean and burned clean again. He had learned by fire. So, starts to the violent bearer away, and it... Incredible. Yeah, it's so good. <laughs> it's a so decent good. and Christian way. 
<laughs> yes, yeah. Um, so Flannery O'Connor, woman who wrote those words, she's born on the Feast of Annunciation, March 25th in the year 1925 in Savannah, Georgia, at a time when that town was about half the size it is now, but still a significant sort of out a sort of outside significance as it was a port town. So it was an important location in both the Revolutionary War and the Civil War. It's, uh, uh, I believe it was the capital of Georgia at one time, but I might be wrong about that. Um, Flannery was born into a devoutly Catholic uh, lace curtain Irish family. For people who don't know, there was something of a division in the um, the Irish immigrant community in, in, in America between the shanty Irish and the lace curtain Irish. And they didn't always like each other all that well. <laughs> uh, I, I, I believe I'm, uh, more I think we're, the, I think we're the shanty. shanty. I'm pretty yeah. sure I'm shanty Irish. <laughs> Not anymore, yeah. baby. That's we made right. it, Brad. We made it. Come on. All That's ancestors right. smile. Here we are. Mm -hmm. We made it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, um, now for our international audience, um, the South in America is not known generally for its Catholics. <laughs> uh, outside of New Orleans, outside of Louisiana. outside of New Orleans, correct, correct, yes, yes. Generally, generally, uh, you know, it, it 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 varies from county to county, county to county, but generally, you're talking about Baptist country. Um, and so, you know, at this time and and before Flannery's time, um, this tended to draw the catholic community sort of together they would form within a city like savannah there would be the catholic side of town sort of um and she was she was part of this i mean um but she was also from a fairly prominent line amongst this and i'll give you an example the hospital that flannery was born in had as its prime ben benefactor flannery's cousin this woman katie sims who will come up later um, Katie Sims had also donated handsomely to the church that the family attended. And in fact, the O'Connors would sometimes step into the Flannery Memorial Chapel of their church to pray. Who was Flannery originally? Well, he was the Confederate officer, John Flannery, who translated his war reputation into investment, banking and brokering on the Savannah Cotton Exchange. And he ended up leaving Katie, his only child and Flannery's cousin, sort of. Uh, roughly a million dollars in those days dollars and katie was became a major philanthropist um she, the chapel as i said part of the hospital flannery was born in part of, and part of the school um that flannery attended as a child now flannery was actually mary flannery o'connor she wouldn't adopt the the she wouldn't put her middle name first until she basically got to grad school but we'll get there um now 1925 <clears throat> In the South, this is a uh, context in which the Civil War was still alive. There were a few Civil War veterans around, and there were definitely people who remembered it from their childhood, right, in 1925. Um, the old ladies, you know, went to chapter meetings of the Daughters of Confederacy. The parish priest had been a drummer boy for the Confederacy. Um, and... You know, and so within, you know, the nation, um, they're in the South. So there's suspicions about the North. And then within the South, Flannery is within this Irish Catholic community that the rest of the South is sort of suspicious of, too. So we've got there's levels, right? Um, We're talking about levels here. We got layers. We got lace, that's right. layers, <laughs> levels. That's right. Mm -hmm. That's right. You know, I, I was hearing recently, too, that uh, there were certain places in the South that did not celebrate the 4th of July until at World War II. Oh, really? That's the thing that kind of reunited the country oh, in the more, that kind of you know. That kind yeah. of doesn't surprise me. It's very actually. interesting to think yeah. about. Yeah. 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 Um, so... Now, <laughs> um, now there's a couple things about Georgia, just just to kind of help us get a sense of where we're at. This is the place, Georgia. I love Georgia, by the way. I know the devil uh, went down there. The devil did go down there. Yeah. He he yeah. lost a fiddle match. So mm -hmm. I mean, we got that. To, we got that to thank Georgia for, if nothing Are else. You telling me uh, you got Georgia on your mind, Brett? That's, That's what right. you're telling me. That's right. Okay. That's right. Very good. Oh, I'm going on a midnight train there. Ah, uh, we had to hopefully, hopefully all of it. 
we got time. Hopefully, we don't, mm. I'm not late. Nice. Uh, <laughs> so, um, but just a couple of things about Georgia, how it's how uh, some things about the way it was founded that might help us understand where we're at. Um, in its original founding, it explicitly outlawed a handful of things: rum, lawyers, hell yeah. hell. Wait, oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> there wasn't a delay there, was there? Because I really, I'm, I'm fucked if there was. He a said, delay. He, he said hell. He said hell yeah on the. <laughs> Right for the people at home, he said, "Hell yeah!" On the Hell yeah! After part. lawyers, so you're yeah. telling me it's ru- wait, no rum, no lawyers, and what do you mean? What do you mean they outlawed blacks? What do you mean? I, you know, I would have to dig into it further. I mean, yeah, I, there were slaves there, pretty sure. So gotcha. I don't know what they meant okay. exactly. Keep, you know what? Keep keep reading your list. I'm, I'll edit. Yeah. I'll edit this well, out. Well, the last one, that I they actually outlawed, won't. I don't. We don't edit. No, yeah, no, yeah, no. Yeah. The last one apparently was Catholics. So in the Georgia founding <laughs> charter, it was like. um yeah, you know, Catholics keep going. This is a this is not a cat. You know, this is not a Catholic Jeez. neighborhood. Jeez, I just I think yeah. it's like one of these things is not like the other. One of these things is yeah. not the same. <laughs> <laughs> wasn't it? Wasn't it a, a prison colony at first? It was like a. Oh, I don't. I don't think that's I, the. Well, maybe at one point it was. Not yeah. to my knowledge. Yeah, I think it was well, actually. Well, you know, it was, it was in the early sort of pre you know pre American independence. All of the pro, all of the colonies, all of the which became you know states. They all kind of started for like under slightly different rules. And I don't know how Georgia varies. I grabbed, I just grabbed a real quick search here on the Google, take it or leave it. This is from Garden and Gun. So, okay. Yeah. Pretty, it's, it's, pretty, pretty, it's, the paper, it's the paper, the paper of record uh, below the Mason Dixon <laughs> line uh, for sure. It, the question is 18th century Georgia was really just King George's penal colony, right? And the yeah. answer is. Georgia wasn't penal in the, in the strict sense, like Devil's Island in French Guiana, but as conceived by its founder, James Oglethorpe, and his trustees in London, Georgia was expressly built on the theory of work release. Oh, so okay. kind of a probationary okay. limbo, possibly, in any okay. case. Okay, yeah. okay. Um, uh, one thing that I'm trying to build this case, that there's some paranoia about Catholics in Georgia at this time. Apparently in 1916, the state uh, implemented something called the Convent Inspection Bill that allowed the government, the Georgian government, to inspect Catholic institutes to ensure the Catholics were not keeping, quote, white slave pens or otherwise sexually exploiting their inmates. Okay. Of course, this was also a time, uh, Flannery's time was also a time of segregation. As I think people know, you know, there are black schools, white schools, black water fountains, white water fountains, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, okay. Now, Flannery, <clears throat> um, focus on her and her family more specifically. This is a big, loving family full of all kinds of characters. And we're not going to talk about a lot, of, many of them, but you just have to imagine this is the kind of thing where like, you know, 40 or 50 people show up to Thanksgiving, right? Was, that was my my family on my yeah, mother's okay. side. My mother was 10 yeah. of 11. Right. I have so many cousins all over the country. I don't even know. If you're right. one of my cousins, you can reach out anytime. There you go. Or darkpod yeah. at gmail.com. Yeah. Hundreds, hundreds of cousins. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Excellent. Excellent. Mm. Um, and also she comes, her, as I said before, her sort of family tree, they're, they're fairly prominent. Um, Despite the Flannery, the use of the name Flannery um, from her cousin's father, that was through marriage. Her her real line passes through the Kleins and the Trainers. Her great grandfather was a guy named Hugh Donnelly Trainer. Excuse me, and he'd been the owner of a prosperous mill in Milledgeville, far to the southwest of Savannah. And we're going to spend a lot of time in Milledgeville later in the story. And she had another great grandfather who'd been a mayor of Milledgeville. On her father's side, it was a little less you know, sort of well-to-do, but nonetheless, Flannery O'Connor's grandfather was a prominent uh, importer and distributor and was one time a director of the Hibernia Bank. So these are people who've put put themselves together one way or another. Um, A little bit about her parents, um, her mother, Regina, who we're going to spend more time with later. Um, Just what I want you to think of her as right now is almost the archetype of the parochial southern woman sort of classy well-mannered but 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 hasn't really traveled much hasn't really ventured too far outside of her social milieu right um uh her father is a little bit more interesting to us 
uh, at this point. He married Regina Flannery's mother when he was 26 years old. And at this time, he's this good looking man, pale blue eyes, got a flare of a mustache. He loved to put on his white linen suit and his straw boater hat and sort of go out on the on the on go out dancing. That was like his oh, vibe. God, to be 25 <laughs> in a white linen suit in the American <laughs> South in the right? what the the 1920s. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. gracious! Amazing. So yeah. gracious me. Yeah. he uh went to military prep school at the benedictine college and tried to get into the naval academy but he could not because his math scores were not great um he was the oldest of eight children uh he's described as robust um, and quote amused and amusing which i feel like that's good i feel like those are good traits to have be, to be amused and amusing. He served in the Georgia National Guard. He was involved in guarding the border in New Mexico during the Mexican Revolution, and he would be deployed to, uh, to France during the Great War, earning medals for his role in helping to rout the Germans from France. He and Regina married in 1922, and uh, with some likely embarrassing help from cousin Katie, they got themselves set up on Charles Charlton Street in Savannah, and very soon, almost immediately after, the marriage was cooling off. Part of the problem was, I think, I think it's twofold. I think part of it was that Edward O'Connor and, you know, folks who are listening to this are probably familiar with this. When you get married, um, you you bring your families, your families get connected. You're marrying the you're marrying the family, whether you like it or not. Right. And sometimes that means you just get pulled into your spouse's family more than the other way. Right. So and which is not a bad thing at all. It's just that's kind of how these things go. Um, I think with Edward, it that sort of happened. And his wife's side is almost entirely women. And I think it was very uh, disorienting. And he didn't necessarily understand the dynamics there. <laughs> all of a sudden, he's suddenly, you know, suddenly he's 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 surrounded by, you know, a dozen women at all times. And a lot of them were powerhouses, socially prominent, like, um, you know, important in their communities, etc. Right. Um, another part is that Edward didn't quite bring the social status that Regina did. And he didn't sort of expand on his social status the way that she probably hoped that he would. Um, it's always tricky, He's, isn't it? Yeah, he, right. He, there's the whole hypergamy thing going on, and yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. And who wears and, the pants? Well, and and the the thing is, there's 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 good reasons for him to have not sort of expanded. I mean, one thing is 1922. We're sort of heading towards the depression, and another is he had he got lupus, and so he or he lupus uh flared up i guess is the what, way what, would, okay would this is one of those things you hear about what what the hell is lupus we always we always pause to talk about a disease because people yeah, assume so, you know yeah mm. yeah well this is important because as people may know flannery ends up with lupus oh so let me just read quickly on um wikipedia and this uh, used to be i love when we get a good disease <laughs> well and, and lupus used to be like a death sentence. Oh. Now it's a little bit more manageable. They kind of have an idea, but like apparently they don't know where it comes from. Like it's it's one of these just bizarre sort of things. Um, <laughs> it's like our toe ghosts. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Yeah, yeah, exactly. That's have a you deep tried cut. cocaine? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> have you tried doing cocaine about it? Right. And here's your bill. That'll be right. that'll be six hundred and eighty nine dollars <laughs> after insurance or, or a chicken. If you got a chicken, <laughs> right? We'll you take can, that yeah, and trade. Yeah, yeah, chicken blood. You get. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, let me just, I'll just read this real quick. We're not doctors. So lupus technically known as systemic lupus, uh, erythematosus is an autoimmune disease in which the body's immune system mistakenly attacks healthy tissue in many parts of the body. Symptoms vary among people and may be mild to severe. Common symptoms include painful and swollen jo- joints, fever, chest pain, hair loss, mouth ulcers, swollen lymph nodes, exhaustion, and a red rash, which is most common, uh, which appears most commonly on the face. Often there are periods of illnesses called flares and periods of remission, which during which there are few symptoms. Um, it is thought to involve a combination of genetics and environmental factors. Um, and you know, interestingly, one thing is. Among identical twins, there's only a 24% chance that they'll both, that the other, if like one has it, that the other will get it. So it's not pure genetics, obviously, because 
Um, so yeah, it's a thing then, that happens. We don't know why it happens and your body really. just, God, man. Yeah. Wow. Science. Yeah. Incredible. Yeah. And Incredible it's one of these happening. autoimmune. Yeah. It's one of these autoimmune things too, where it's like, you don't get rid of it. You manage it and you avoid the things that cause it to get worse and mm. that, that sort mm. of thing. Right. All right. right. Um, so, so he ends up, he ends up having that. We'll talk a little bit more about that in, in his, Edward's life and in, and in, uh, Flannery's life. Um, in a little bit. Um, now, 1920, so March 25th, 1925, little Flannery O'Connor, Mary Flannery O'Connor is born. And let me just read a little bit. Um, my primary source for biographical material, I'll have other sources I touch on, and I'll mention those when I get to them, but is this uh, book Flannery, A Life of Flannery O'Connery, Flannery O'Connor by Brad Gooch. Um, quite good, quite readable, interesting. Um, got a very good uh very a lot of notes very good notes uh, but i just want to read a little bit about her childhood from this volume um quote o'connor's early childhood is captured in a collection of family photographs in the earliest a series of studio portra portraits taken for a family christmas card the little girl is smiling and charming legs crossed on a stage prop of a bench showing all the signs of being as one family friend has recalled beautifully cared for in some, she is hugging a doll. In others, she is posed next to her mother, who reveals a sultry beauty as she stares directly into the camera. In these staged portraits, mother and, fa uh, mother and daughter look, uh, look together into the camera. In pictures with her father, the girl turns her beaming face towards his, and he returns her smile. Um, she loved her dad a lot. Um, we're going to talk more about this. And she loved her mother, too. I mean, this is a, a tight-knit family, but her father, they were... They were very, very tight from the beginning. Um, Flannery quickly reveals herself as a little girl to be uh, precocious and even a little eccentric, even as like a young, young girl. Um, all the while, Regina, her mother, is trying to mold her into the perfect Southern little girl. And one thing I want you to think about as Flannery is getting older, probably in her teenage years, this might be a this might be a deep cut for for the younger crowd. But do people remember Daria? Kevin, you remember Daria? Yeah, yeah I remember Daria. Remember it was a very particular type of, of woman mm -hmm. that you you would very very strong trope energy there yeah. from the nineties. Well, Andrew O'Connor as a young person is sort of like if you took Daria and dropped her into nineteen twenty five Savannah, Georgia. So she doesn't have all the same references and stuff, but a similar kind of vibe, right? Sort of like. She she seems shy, but she might be being shy because like she's probably smarter than you and is annoyed by you. <laughs> right? It's that it's more. I I yeah. I'm thinking about somebody I grew up with right now. Somebody my yeah. brother dated. Uh, yeah. Literally the daughter of a of a senator. <laughs> like a name. Yeah. A name, I wrecked their jet ski once. Sorry. Sorry. It makes yeah, it sound yeah. like I'm not Shanty Irish when I say that. This was in North Dakota, okay? <laughs> right. So I didn't right. even know they had jet skis. Yeah, I, they Dakota. even let us have <laughs> a senator. It's just incredible. You wrecked, you wrecked the only jet ski in North Dakota. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Kevin. <laughs> uh, there's a shrine to it now. Yeah. Um, this is about uh, Flannery and her dad. The affinity between Ed O'Connor and his daughter was certainly, quote, on the inside, too. Uh, they looked alike, also. Uh, continuing on. His pride in her could amount to infatuation. From 1927 till 1931, he included a separate listing for Miss Mary Flannery O'Connor in the Savannah City Directory, an unusual, whimsical gesture for a preschool child. Another fond touch shows up in the 1936 dia uh, Diocese Bulletin, quote, role of the female orphanage society, crediting Mary Flannery O'Connor as a contributor rather than her parents. A co-conspirator in her world of childhood fantasy, wishing sometimes to be a writer himself, he slipped her notes signed, quote, King of Siam. In their game, she dubbed herself, quote, Lord Flannery O'Connor. She would hide little poems or drawings under his breakfast plate or tuck them into his napkin for him to discover when he sat down at the kitchen table. He liked to fold up these tokens of affection, stick them in his wallet, and show them off to friends during the day. So very, just very sweet. Very, very sweet. Um, Now, her, her early years are kind of uneventful from a biographical standpoint. You know, there's not... Sometimes in this show, you know... Um, I, I tweeted out about the Joseph Conrad episode today just because I randomly tweet out episode links. Um, 
And remember, Joseph Conrad like grew up as like a political refugee in Siberia, right? Um, this is not the case with Flannery. It's a pretty nice childhood. We can talk about, you know, the fact that as a Catholic community, they were a little bit, they were a little bit ostracized, but they're also a huge community of their own right. And, you know, there's a certain way in which it's like if your community is big enough and supportive enough, who cares what those people over there think? Um, so yeah, it's kind of just like a lovely, a lovely idyllic childhood in a lot of ways. Um, and she has her first brush with fame quite young and it's extremely charming. <laughs> She had, um, she had trained a chicken to walk backwards, sort of. She loved that. She loved birds of all kinds. When she was about six years old, she trained a chicken to walk backwards. Somehow, uh, Pathé News, a British producer of documentaries and newsreels, caught wind of this and came down to Savannah and made a little, little, tiny little film about it. I'm going to read about this real quick. Um, and you can see it. It's on YouTube, too. This, uh. Uh, Chicken Walks Backwards, Pathway News, Pathé News, P-A-T-H-E. Um, quote, O'Connor's screen debut exists in all its fragility in a Pathé film archive. The brief uh, stretch of scratchy film opens with a title card announcing an italic script, Odd Fowl Walks Backward to Go Forward so she can look back to see where she went. For all of four seconds, O'Connor, a self-possessed little girl, is glimpsed in glaring afternoon light, a wisp of curls peeking from beneath her cap, calmly coping with three chickens fluttering in her face. And close up, the biggest of her bantams then jerks backward a half dozen times on a short stretch of pavement, supporting the skeptical theory of one relative that it was merely suffer suffering from a cognitive skip. <laughs> um, so it's just a charming, charming little thing. Um, uh yeah i think um part of the reason they did this sort of it's, thing was uh, it's giving yeah, ballad of buster buster scruggs energy <laughs> that's what i'm getting bit. yeah I, I i think one thing i as i was doing some reading on this is like why did pathé news why would they come down here um 1931 you're talking the height of the depression i think there was an effort to try and find just some nice stuff that was going on, right? It didn't have to be newsworthy or, you know, groundbreaking, but just like, can we have a nice, everybody's having a hard time. Let's just have a nice 30 second thing to watch that all makes us smile, you know, so it was that kind of thing. Um, let me read a little bit. Now, I'm going to jump around in, in her writing and try to pull in stuff when I think it's relevant to the story, because a lot of her writing is like loosely by autobiographical. Um, but this is a bit about, I think, inspired by her childhood from a story called, um, oh, what is it? It's the uh, uh, A Temple of the Holy Ghost is the name of the story. <clears throat> I'm just going to read this little bit here. Quote, all week, the two girls were calling each other Temple One and Temple Two, shaking with laughter and getting so red and hot that they were positively ugly, particularly Joanne, who had sp spots on her face anyway. They came in the brown convent uniforms they had to wear at Mount uh, St. Scholastica, but as soon as they opened their suitcases, they took off the uniforms and put on red skirts and loud blouses. They put on lipstick and their Sunday shoes and walked around in the high heels all over the house, always passing the long mirror in the hall slowly to get a look at their legs. None of their ways were lost on the child. The child is Flannery, you know. Um, if only one of them had come, that one would have played with her. But since there were two of them, she was out of it and watched them suspiciously from a distance. They were 14, two years older than she was, but neither of them was bright, which was why they had been sent to the convent. If they had gone to a regular school, they wouldn't have done anything but think about boys. At the convent, the sisters, her mother said, would keep a grip on their necks. The child decided, after observing them for a few hours, that they were practically morons, and she was glad to have inherited any of... Uh, she, she was glad to think that they were only second cousins and she couldn't have inherited any of their stupidity. Susan called herself Suzanne. She was very skinny, but she had a pretty pointed face and red hair. Joanne had yellow hair that was naturally curly, but she talked through her nose and when she laughed, she turned purple in patches. Neither one of them could say an intelligent thing and all their sentences began, quote, you know this boy I know? Well, one time he dot dot dot. So anyway, I feel like that gives you a sense of what she how she sort of saw the world around her. Um, she goes to St. Vincent's Grammar School for Girls, which had, quote, a nearly medieval aura of Latinate order and spiritu spirituality. It was run by the Sisters of Mercy, who also ran the hospital she was born in. Um, and 
This was just 40 yards from home. So everything is, you can even go on Google Maps now and actually find the Flannery O'Connor childhood home. You can find the church she went to. It's all very, everything's right near each other. Um, at this time, she would describe herself, these grammar school days, as, quote, a pigeon-toed ch uh, only child with a receding chin and a you leave me alone or I'll bite you complex. Uh, <laughs> you leave me alone or I'll bite you. My my son, my three-year-old son is into a biting phase. Oh, is he, that right? Yeah. yeah. And my my one nearly two-year-old daughter does not like it at all. Well, she, yeah, that's understandable. And he just chomps. <laughs> he has no idea what he's doing. <laughs> right. Yeah. Right. Very yeah. odd. Yeah. His teeth can do some damage if, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Sure you go. That's how you yeah. survive as a shanty Irish Right. That's right. You got to be able to fight with everything. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Elbows and toenails and everything. For real. Um, she, uh, you know, in, so we've got that, right? The overbite, the receding chin, the pigeon toed. Um, she would wear self orthopedic shoes to try and fix her pigeon toe. Um, and she eventually wore braces, which in the 1930s, I can't imagine what these braces were like. Um, and I think. You take that something like out of the Saw movies, right? <laughs> take yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> Rusting. I'm <Ugh. laughs> like, oh man. Um, so you can imagine, you know, because of because of those aspects, I think how she, you know, how she appeared, but also because of her personality, she tended to keep to herself. She spent most of her time as a little girl in her bedroom drawing pictures of birds. Love birds. Birds fa are factor into every aspect of her life, actually. And we'll talk more about that. Um, now, the one thing about her, you know, she's described as shy, but she could actually be very stubborn and very forthright when she wanted to be. One teacher remembered her from her grade grammar school days as an unremarkable student who could be, quote, a little forward with adults, which I think is probably somebody trying to euphemistically cover up some things that happened, <laughs> right? Flannery, you know, and she's, she, you can imagine, I, I I have a feeling that she was the kind of kid who would just tell you if you were wrong, right to your face, or if she thought you were wrong. You know, I don't think she, she suffered fools very easily, um, especially early on. Um, nonetheless, she made friends. Um, she started a little group of girls around 1934, so she would have been nine. Um, she called these the Merryweather Girls, and she nominated herself the president of the club. She was always, she was a little organizer, oh, oftentimes. The yeah, yeah, very cute. Right. Yep, cute right. kids do this. Right. Love that. Right. Love that. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. It, 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 yeah. Take my advice, sweetie. It pays off. You're going to make yeah. it. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 You might irritate the shit out of the other kids, <laughs> but eventually you become a president for real. Right, right, exactly. There you go. Yeah, uh, most of this, most of apparently the the club activities of the Merry World Merryweather Girls was to ha so she would have an attentive audience that she could read her little stories that she was writing. Um, the one of which, the only one that's really remembered, is one that was about a family of ducks who traveled around the world. So it's very Aww. cute. There's Aww. so many cute little things about her. childhood. <laughs> Yeah. Is now a good time to announce this year's Art of Darkness live and oh, where sure. it's going to yeah. be and when? Because we're we putting on little show, putting on a little show for our friends as well. We are. We are. We're having hey. our own little Merryweather Girls event. <laughs> we are the Merryweather Girls. Uh, what is it? A uh, pulp, old stick and pulp. Old yeah, old, and yeah, pulp are, yeah. Are putting yeah, on yeah. a putting on a show. Yeah, we're hitting uh, the road. An old, yeah. We're hitting the road and doing an old timey <laughs> show in beautiful Ham Tramick, Michigan. That's right. Hamtramic, 7 p.m. October 26th at Planet Ant. Yeah. Planet Ant. Tickets legendary, will legendary go independent on. theater. Mm -hmm. Like you're not only if you come to this, you're not only supporting us, you're supporting like a, a theatrical establishment in the Detroit area. Yes. October 26th, 2024. Do you want to tell people what the topic is, Brad? Yeah, it's the death of Houdini. So we're we can't do a four hour show live. People wouldn't tolerate it and we wouldn't be able we wouldn't like doing it either. So what we'll do is we'll do a trunk. We're going to do a truncated show. Um, Houdini died. Um, the, the great magician, escape artist, illusionist, whatever. Uh, he died in the city of Detroit. Uh, on Halloween, so we're having a Halloween themed event. We're going to talk, tell the story of the death of Houdini, and you know, provide some good local historical context to all of that. 
Um, we're going to have a magician open the show, which I think should we're going to have a, fun. a special guest. Uh, yeah. We're going to have a, a Mr. Bluth come, the magician. Is it Joe? Joe Bluth? Is <laughs> Joe that Bluth. it? Joe That'd be Bluth. pretty awesome. <laughs> no, we're actually we're going to get a real yeah. fu functional adult <laughs> adult magician. It's going to be amazing. Uh, be it's great. going to be going to be a ton of fun. The magician will, will open the show for us. Then we'll do mm -hmm. the the Houdini mini. You know the the live Houdini, the death of Harry Houdini, October twenty yeah. sixth, Hamtramck, Michigan. You know all the details will be at artofdarkpod.com. Brad has done the booking to kind of get us set up for yeah. that. It's going to be a lot of fun. Halloween costumes yes. happening yeah. I'll, i will be coming in from out of town i will wear a costume you will wear a costume we're gonna have a really good oh, yeah. time and that's our little that's our little merry weather club later this year <laughs> in october oh and by the way that will also record it and it will be put online but there oh, is yeah. nothing like being there irl with your very mm -hmm. online podcast friends yeah it's gonna be a, it's gonna be a blast i can't wait yeah can't wait yeah um so yeah a uh, family of ducks traveled around the world in Flannery O'Connor's first, excuse me, her first story. Um, one thing, so as I was kind of saying, you know, Edward O'Connor, her father, he didn't really have a breakout career in any kind of way. He was mostly working in real estate. He started a construction company at one point. None of it really took off. Um, and in 1937, Edward O'Connor began to show symptoms of lupus. And I'm going to read a little bit about this. Um, and this is probably where our first real sort of darkness comes in. Uh, quote, uh, yeah, at the height of this term as state commander and public speaker, uh, he was very involved in the American Legion. Uh, a whitish patch appeared on Ed Edward O'Connor's forehead. Seemingly innocuous, the skin rash turned out to be the first visible symptom of an autoimmune disorder that causes the body to produce antibodies that attack its own healthy tissues. Initially thought to be rheumatoid arthritis, the d disease was eventually diagnosed as lupus, as we know. This is one of the challenges with lupus because the symptoms are so um, diverse. It often, especially at that time, it was often misdiagnosed, generally diagnosed as rheumatoid arthritis. You treat the two things differently. So oftentimes people suffer for a while with kind of the wrong treatment. Um, uh, let's see. So uh, in an effort, while he's undergoing the early stages of lupus, in an effort to stabilize his career, the family moves first to Atlanta, um, where he's going to work as a real estate appraiser for the FHA. Remember, this is still the Depression. So the so there's these pro there's these various federal programs that were sort of uh, in, instituted to be to provide productive work for people, right? Um, and this is this was one of them. They needed a guy, somebody to do, be a real estate appraiser. Edward O'Connor became one of these. They leave behind the home in Savannah. Katie Sims. Um, Flannery's rich cousin had loaned Edward the money for that house, and she, uh, Katie Sims, basically took over the loan. So now she owned another house in Savannah. I think she owned like four or five of them. Um, and in the spring of 1938, uh, after uh, Edward's career kind of flounders again, uh, they move to Milledgeville and find a place to live now interestingly enough everywhere they go they have a ton of family they go to atlanta they got a bunch of family they go to milledgeville they got a bunch of family right they, they, everywhere they go there's you know a dozen different a dozen people that they know who welcome who welcome them in um so while savannah tends to claim flannery um there's the flannery o'connor house i believe is in is in savannah milledgeville is really what i would call flannery's home um and i'm going to read a bit about this so yeah she moved they moved there in 1938 so she's uh 13 years old she lives there most of the rest of her life and you know milledgeville is kind of an interesting place so i'm going to read a little bit about it <clears throat> quote milledgeville was our town done with a middle georgia drawl Described by one journalist as a styling epicenter for the Deep South, the sleepy community at the dead center of Georgia, with barely 6,000 residents, blended provincial cons uh, conservatism with much local color. We have a girls' college here, O'Connor wrote in the early 50s, but the lacy atmosphere is fortunately destroyed by a reformatory, an insane asylum, and a military school. 
Georgia State College for Women did provide the town's grace notes, a steady supply of male and female professors. The reformatory was Georgia State Training School for Boys, the military school, Georgia Military College. Yet because of State Hospital, previously named the Milledgeville Lunatic Asylum, the town was mostly synonymous in Georgia slang with going crazy. As one miffed character says to another in Clock Without Hands by Carson McCullers, uh, quote, a thing like this makes you ought think makes me think you ought to be in Milledgeville. <laughs> so the town, the town that, that Flannery lived in was literally like the, the, the loony town. town. <laughs> we had we had that town in North Dakota, Jamestown. Jamestown's where okay. it was. You know, we're gonna send yeah. you to Jamestown. Right. Yeah, yeah, he's okay. up in yeah, right. I heard he's up in yeah. last I heard he was up in Jamestown. Or, yeah. Like, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. 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 That yeah. Kind of Awkward. Thing. Mm -hmm. uh, continuing on, though hardly as cosmopolitan, as cosmopolitan as Savannah, this fourth capital of Georgia from 1803 to, till 1868 was built on a similar geometric plan. As Nellie uh, Womack Hines pointed out in her Treasure album, that's a book, the capital city named for Governor George, uh, John Millage probably has the distinction of being one of two cities thus molded into shape for such a purpose, the other being our national capital at Washington, D.C., the original plan reserved four large squares for a capital, governor's mansion, penitentiary, and cemetery with 19 wide streets intersecting at right angles. Dubbed a town of columns, Milledgeville became identified with a Milledgeville federal style of architecture marked by colossal porticos, cantilevered balconies, pediments adorned with sunbursts, and fan-lit doorways. When O'Connor's professor friend Ted Spivy visited, he found this early style idealistic, idealistic as opposed to the town's mid-century Greek revival mansions, recalling the fanaticism of cotton barons defending slavery and states' rights. So it's a sort of a, it's a southern town, but it's like, it, it's, obviously it is, but I, I just like to imagine that um, it, it's, a lot of it's sort of intentionally built. It's, it's kind of like a dream of a southern town in a way. Um, so this was, this is where she would end up living. When was that um, being written that what you were just reading there that was being written later, right? Not in the, not yeah, in the 20s. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. This, yeah. Is the, this is from the biography. Yeah. Right. Of course. Yeah. And she's talking about when they reference our town, they're talking about mm -hmm. the great play by Thornton Wilder. Yeah. Yep. 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 Future, future subject, all time, great wow. American play. Maybe, yeah, maybe I, I think still probably the most performed American play. Oh, I uh, imagine it is. Yeah. Yeah. yeah great. Play. I think I think my high school did it or a version. Everybody, of it. everybody yeah. does it. It's a thing you yeah. got to do. Yeah. Yeah. So, okay. So in Milledgeville, Flannery attends an elementary school school that was a sort of laboratory laboratory school for practice teachers from the Georgia State College for Women. This was Peabody Elementary, which had an eclectic and and rigorous approach. O'Connor did okay, but was sync quickly singled out for her poor spelling, which continued. And sometimes you see in her letters, you're like, that's not how you, that's not, that's not how you spell that word. <laughs> I'm a professional reader. <laughs> right, exactly. I, exactly. I like I like things that are eclectic and rigorous. Yeah, That's a too. good combination of it is. stuff. Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 Um, she did make a few friends here, largely friends that were handpicked by her mother. Remember, her mother's always trying to mold her into the perfect Southern lady. So she'd say, ah, Flannery should be friends with that girl. That would, that might help her, you know, figure out how to hold her teacup or whatever. Um, but she did make friends, interestingly enough, with one of the most attractive, popular girls in her grade. Um, and they really seem to click. And I think there's, we'll see this throughout, throughout flannery's life she's very eccentric she kind of stands out by by receding sort of from the scene but oftentimes as soon as people sort of get her deal they they love her like it's it's one of those things she 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 does kind of win people over but at first it's a little uncertain what to do with her um so you know she she and Again, one of her one of her eccentricities was she would used to walk a bantam chicken around on a leash, and the um, she also had a pet quail that she kept around that was named Amelia Earhart. That's and a fine she, name for a quail. It's That's a great an excellent name for a quail. For a quail. <laughs> yeah. yeah, she had a she had a chicken that she brought to Girl Scout meetings, and the chicken was named Ali Aloysius. <laughs> so she's just this like I I found myself there's very a certain um, by um, Flannery, eccentricity yeah, here. Yeah, there's it's some so ex eccentricity here. I like yeah. it. Yeah. Um, now, interestingly enough, in Milledgeville, at, for a while they lived in something called the Klein Mansion, and I think the Klein Mansion is still, if you go on like home and garden tours in Milledgeville, this still might be on that circuit. It certainly was at the time. It's this beautiful antebellum mansion, right? Like. 
you know, one of these huge, maybe it was part of a plantation. And if it wasn't, it was made to look like it was at one time. Right. Um, and this was run by one of Flannery's aunts. Um, and it was a matriculation point for all the clients and trainers of all, of all over Georgia, all from, from Fl uh, Flannery's mother's line. Right. So cousins, aunts, uncles, um, all kinds of people. Some of them, if, some of them, even from Gasp up north, would come down. Um, they also got to spend a lot of time out on a farm uh, called, later called Andalusia, which is a 550-acre dairy farm owned by their bachelor uncle, Doctor Bernard Klein. And I'm only putting that out there because that's going to come up later. This farm. So cool, right? Yeah. All right. Quite a quite a childhood. Yeah, it's a rich, uh, full childhood with pet birds and <laughs> little eccentricity, weirdness, misspellings. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. cute. Yeah. yeah. Now they they did end up going to Georgia for sorry Atlanta for a while because of her father's job. Flannery really did not like Atlanta. It comes up in two different. Uh, it comes up prominently in two different stories of hers. Um, one was a late encounter with the enemy and another um, uh, called the artificial word I'm not supposed to say on the internet, uh, the N-word. Uh, we'll read from the, the artificial N-word a little bit later. Um, one thing that was interesting, uh, her time in Atlanta was coincided with when uh, Gone with the Wind came out. And the Gone with the Wind, when it premiered, it premiered in Atlanta. It didn't they didn't premiere in in Hollywood? And I think we've lost a sense of how big of a deal Gone with the Wind was. <laughs> like it was monumental. There had never been a movie like this. I think it was years and years before anybody any uh, any movie even approximated the ticket sales. Um, and it really like. Suddenly, for like a, a weekend, Atlanta was like an international city, right? Um, and she has this great, uh, I was going to read a bit of it, but I think for the sake of time, I'm, I'm, I'm going to kind of skip it. But Late Encounter with the Enemy is about this old Confederate general, quote unquote general, who's like almost, a, he's like 100 years old. They bring him out for the Gone with the Wind premiere, and he doesn't remember anything. They ask him about the war. And it's like he doesn't he has no memories of any of this stuff. Right. And the only thing he remembers after the premiere is the gone with the wind premiere. <laughs> um, and 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 there's all kinds of metaphorical things about I think Flannery's telling you about what gone with the wind meant for the South's reckoning with the Civil War and all that. You can get very intellectual and 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 cerebral about this. Um, but ultimately, I think for Flannery. She resented Gone with the Wind for very personal reasons. And the biggest one is that she's a Southern woman trying to be a writer. She's writing some pretty unusual stuff. And she keeps having people around her saying, like, you could write the next Gone with the Wind, Flannery. Imagine that. Why don't you try writing something like Gone with the Wind? You know, that Margaret Mitchell, she really did something with that Gone with the Wind, right? She heard this for years and years and years. And I think it just bred a resentment for the, the whole thing, which which it would, right? Yeah, I could see that. Yeah. Uh, um, okay. So now, anyway, things are going rough, fairly okay when she's in Atlanta, sort of in her teen years. Um, but... Well, well, let's just let's just read this part. This is this this is one of the sadder parts of the whole story here. Um, quote, this is from the the biography by Brad Gooch. Quote, in the fall of 1940, the silhouette of death that O'Connor described in an apprentice story as a man in white coming slow up the road to take you grew more distinct because their daughter was unhappy in school in Atlanta. Her and parent excuse me, her parents enrolled her for the 10th grade back in Peabody High School in Milledgeville. Edward O'Connor, under the care of physicians in Atlanta, moved in alongside his two brother, brothers-in-law in Bell House. One of them was uh, the, the guy who owned the farm. Soon, uh, even this shaky, shaky arrangement fell apart. A worst-case scenario came true. As his health deteriorated, O'Connor could no longer hold down his government job. By the end of the year, he retreated to the Klein mansion to spend his last months as an invalid, dependent on the kindness of his wife's family for care. His 15-year-old daughter, daughter watched as the father she adored 
a middle ma- a middle aged man, otherwise in his prime, suffered a mysterious, painful, wasting death from the fatal illness. Edward O'Connor's death on Saturday, the first of February, nineteen forty one, came exactly a month after his forty fifth birthday. So, Flannery was fifteen years old, uh, and she would rarely speak of him again after this, and not because she didn't care, but this was. You know, sort of the formative pain of her life really was losing, was losing this man. Um, yeah. Um, it's yeah. never a, never a great age to lose a parent. Uh, no. 15. Oof, there's rough. a lot yeah. going on. Yeah. A lot going yeah. on. Now you got to Yeah, you're right up against mix. adulthood and yeah, yeah, it's tough. Yeah, you're already having all kinds of feelings. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> now you got more. Right, right. <laughs> Yeah, so um so anyway, continuing on as Flannery did, um she uh you know she starts making um so when her father dies, they're done with Atlanta because her mother has no reason to be in Atlanta, right? They don't want to be in the city. They're gonna stay in Milledgeville, they live in the Klein Mansion for quite a while quite a while. Um and um uh, Flannery continues going to the, the Peabody school. Um she starts making cartoons for the the Peabody Palladium, which is the high school new, newspaper, and eventually becomes the art editor of the of this newspaper. She becomes known for making quote single frame satires, which became very popular around campus, um, and so so popular that in fact, when she headed off to college at first, she thought her career would be as a political cartoonist. That was sort of her plan, and she was starting to try to figure out how she might be able to make that work. Um, High school, she also starts to read in earnest, uh, primarily Poe, Edgar Allan Poe. That was her chief, her chief influence as a teenager. Um, wow, I can see that having read mm-hmm. Wise Blood for sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah cool. It's definitely, it's definitely in there. And it's funny she so her her like the book she read over and over and over again was the ten volume collected works of Poe, and most specifically, volume eight, Humorous Tales, which is not actually the most well-known Poe stuff, right? It's, you know, if you go back to our Edgar Allan Poe episode, we might not have talked about any of the stories that were in the hum- Humorous Tales volume. Um, so just kind of interesting. Um, she also, in high school, started making her own little kind of cartoon books with uh, that starred ducks and birds as primary characters. This is her thing. She loves birds. Ducks are adorable. Birds they, are adorable. They, they really are. <laughs> yeah, you're gonna love love ducks. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm telling you, man. My little my little daughter, almost two. I yeah. she can already. We say, well, what does the duck say? And she does this quack quack. quack oh yeah. Quack. Awesome. I mean, you, you just want to gobble her up. She's so cute. Quack that's, quack that's quack that's quack. A, oh, it's the best. Adorable. <laughs> yeah. There you go. It's oh, so fun. I love that. I love yeah. that. Um, now she does start to take um, some creative writing courses in high school, and I just thought. Uh, I just thought this was interesting. This is uh, a friend of hers, or a, a, at least a, a girl she went to school with, um, uh, a woman named Elizabeth Shreve Ryan. She, quote, recalls the sensation caused by O'Connor's writing in a high school creative writing class. Quote, being in a creative writing class with Flannery, uh, Mary Flannery was sheer torture. I remember she wrote a very strange story with weird characters. I don't know whether it was a ghost story, but it was gripping. As World War II was just beginning, I wrote some drivel about a soldier and his girlfriend. Her stories were written with panache and a very wry sense of humor, but they were just weird. <laughs> yeah, I love that. Based, so, based. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Uh, So next up for Flannery after high school, she goes to the Georgia State College for Women. Uh, There's a college for women right there. Why wouldn't you go there, right? Um, She was placed in an accelerated program, as one might expect. Uh, Meanwhile, she's living in the Klein Mansion. Um, And, you know, one thing I want to note here. Well, we'll we'll actually circle back to that. Um, College was better for Flannery than high school was. I think I think kind of what happens when she starts going into college is the the intellectual stimulation of education starts to catch up with her. You know, high school wasn't really wasn't really doing a whole lot for her in that department. But she gets into college and it, it starts she starts it starts being interesting to her um, and she starts to be have interesting relationships with teachers. And let me give you one quote. Uh 
this is uh <laughs> this is somebody talking about flannery and a teacher at the at the college quote they would not have been a happy combination uh catherine scott the name of this teacher uh thought flannery had great talent but she wanted her to write like jane austen she was the kind of teacher who expected to be a mentor and to be the one who gives out the box of knowledge um as Scott was a family friend and had been in a small fourth grade class with Regina Klein, Flannery's mother, both teacher and pupil, pupil were perfectly civil. Fran Richardson, a student in the class, has reported this, quote, they would start talking and forget the rest of us were there. I told Mary Flannery once that I wished I could borrow some of her creativity, and she replied, I'd exchange it for your ability to attract men. Uh, a little bit further down. Even then, it was obvious Flannery was a genius warped warped but a genius all the same um okay so during her time in college there's a few things going on historically um she's born in 1925 so she's in college when uh uh well actually no she's yeah she's in college during world war ii pearl harbor happened when she was 16 right um there was a lot of race discussion her college the georgia state college for women was run by a very um uh very uh, liberal president on the race issue at the at the very least and in fact while flannery was at that school excuse me the governor of georgia took away the college's accreditation because the president of the school was uh i think because he said something in favor of in integration um, so they, for, for a while, suddenly the college did, wasn't accredited because of this issue. Um, uh, but Flannery, you know, Flannery never really got involved in the politics stuff one way or the other. Um, and also she never really deviated from her faith. She didn't chase boys. She didn't party. She didn't, you know, she didn't really do any of the college stuff actually um the only club she joined when she started was something called the newman club which was basically was a group of that's the catholic it's the college yeah. catholics yeah the newman yeah yeah, yeah. yeah it was Whatever. her and nine yeah. other girls from campus were in this club and they, just, they went to church together right um incredibly and, yeah. based incredibly based <laughs> love it <laughs> she, she didn't care the newman yeah, the she, newman centers are a big deal i mean they're oh, i didn't i didn't uh, know about that. i've never heard of it yeah they, they have yeah. one they have one on i uh, like I, almost every i mean they're every major college campus is going to have something like that yeah yeah, really? yeah. A little little bastion of uh of uh sanity <laughs> on the college campuses <laughs> there you go but, uh you know yeah yeah um she also did continue with her cartooning uh, and I'm going to read a little bit about this because it's kind of interesting. <clears throat> uh, and she, she, she was, uh, you know, she went from putting them in the high school paper to getting them into the college paper. Quote, O'Connor's debut cartoon appeared on October 6th with her chicken logo fixed in the lower left corner. That was her, for a while. Her signature was, it was a drawing of a chicken. That was also her initials. Amazing. Uh, <laughs> right. Uh, this this cartoon is titled, quote, The Immediate Results of Physical Fitness Day. And its subject was a spent girl in baggy sweater, skirt and saddle Oxfords, stiffly supporting herself with a cane, her tongue hanging out. This illustration accompanied a feature story about uh, the physical fitness program. Um, over the next few months, she concocted an unfolding freeze of such challenged types. Some, like a harried, limp-haired girl staggering under a load of books, was not were an obvious self-portrait. Quote, I thought of her then as a cartoonist who also tried her hand at writing, says Gertrude uh, Elric, an, uh, uh, a fellow student. She was a genius at depicting us Jessies running around campus with scarves hanging out of our pockets or messily draped on our heads. Uh, a Jessie was is the Georgia State College for Women. They like abbreviated that to be Jessies. They called themselves Jessies. By the time O'Connor completed her eight cartoons of the first fall quarter, she had developed her favorite situation, a short, fat girl and her tall, thin sidekick bouncing caustic remarks off each other. In an October 24th spoof of a faculty student softball game, one of the girl pair, one of the pair of girls loaded down with books grouses to her friend, quote, ah, nuts. I thought we'd at least have one day off after the game. The accompanying article factory score 13 over seniors 12. The steady outfitting of her odd couple with raincoats, galoshes, and umbrellas was a wink to a noting audience. Quote, it seemed to rain a lot in Milledgeville, and we wore khaki-colored cotton gabardine raincoats most of the time, explains a fellow student. This is the way I remember Flannery. She would come slouching along like the rest of us. Now, <clears throat> these cartoons were popular enough that word got out. <clears throat> Quote, 
Enough excitement was generated by these cartoons that at the end of her first school year, the Macon Telegraph and News, Macon is a nearby larger city, ran a profile written by Nellie Womack Hines alongside a freshman photo of a grinning O'Connor wearing round glasses, her hair done in the typical pin curled style of the 1940s. The piece was headlined, quote, Mary O'Connor shows talent as cartoonist. Hines found herself with an, un an easily quotable subject in the girl she characterized as, quote, fast making a name for herself as an up and coming cartoonist. When asked uh, how she went about her work, Miss O'Connor replied that first, quote, she caught her rabbit. In this case, she explained the rabbit was a good idea, which must tie up with some current event or a recent happening on the campus. Hines rightly observed with coaching from the cartoonist, quote, usually Mary presents two students in her cartoons, a tall, lanky, dumb bunny and a short and stocky smart aleck, female, of course. The interviews, uh, con con excuse me, the interviewer's conclusion was politic. Quote, a keen sense of humor enables her to see the funny side of situations which she portrays minus the sting. So anyway, another kind of brush with fame, right? Um, yeah. Um, <clears throat> let's see. So she started at college. <clears throat> she only joined the Newman Club. By the time she leaves college, by the time she's on the other end of the Georgia State, uh, Georgia State College for Women, She's actually sort of a big woman on campus. She's the um, editor-in-chief of the literary magazine. She's the feature editor of the yearbook. She's the art editor of the newspaper. And she's in all of the honor societies, right? Kind of, she did well. <laughs> yeah, she's kind of a trapper keeper girl. She is, yeah. She's, yeah, yeah. she's going to meetings. Yep, <laughs> exactly. Yep, exactly. Yeah. Yep. Um, a little bit more about the sort of last part of her college or her undergraduate career, I should say. And every um, one of her trapper keepers has a chicken. It's Different a chicken. It. It's just That's chickens. Right. All chickens all the time. <laughs> That's right. I like that. It's a That's real right. vibe to like you really embrace the chicken as a totemic animal. It is. It's very, right. I like it. Yeah. I like that. It's flightless. It's kind of yeah. like, yeah, it's, it's, a little a, derpy. it's interesting. Yeah. 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 But funny. It shows you get a sense of humor. Right. Yeah. Right. Right. And yeah. it's not self-aggrandizing. It's not like a eagle you know or something where you're like you know right. i'm a badass it's the, like the modest yeah. the humble chicken yeah. yeah yeah but where would we be without the chicken where would we be without the chicken i do have this theory that america exists <laughs> to facilitate the proliferation of different kinds of chicken sandwiches <laughs> it's a it's a machine for so, cranking out we are sandwich. america is basically the paperclip like problem <laughs> the paperclip thought experiment for, for spicy, hot and spicy chicken sandwiches. We're doing a we're doing a dang good we're job. We're doing a dang good job. <laughs> it's not a country, it's an experiment. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's hilarious. Um uh the most important class O'Connor took at G uh Georgia State College for Women turned out to be one of her last, Social Science 412, Introduction to Modern Philosophy. Um uh this class, quote, was a survey of modern philosophers in the assigned textbook, The Making of the Modern Mind, by Germ, uh, by John Herman Randall. Um, uh, sorry, reading down. As uh, her professor recalled, the book was, quote, an academic bestseller whose viewpoint was secular humanism grounded in pragmatism and took for granted that the Renaissance and the Age of Enlightenment set the Western mind free from the benightedness of medieval thought. The hero of the course was the 17th century French philosopher Descartes for um, relying on his discourse on method, on mathematics and science to unlock the secrets of a purely material world. Yet a few weeks into the course, the professor became aware of a persistent, subtle scowl. Quote, Flannery <laughs> sat in class, listened intently, took notes, and without her saying a word, it became clear that she didn't believe a word of what I was saying. Oh my God. <laughs> one of us. Yeah. One of us. They lied to us. Yeah. There yeah. were no dark ages. That's right. Bullshit. Um, Enlightenment propaganda. <laughs> uh, let's see. By the end of the quarter, uh, she had emerged from her shell enough to give the professor a hard time. As she relive, relived one exchange with him in a letter to uh in a letter later, quote, he is he is the one that one day in a class says, quote, the medieval church was polytheistic. I rose and said the medieval church was not polytheistic, right? 
she, so these are the kinds of arguments she's having. People, um, yeah, really, yeah, yeah, right. She's basically yeah. standing up for the one true faith in one she of is. these pro propaganda classes. Right. Uh, right. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, people have all sorts of crazy misconceptions of the church in the Middle Ages, and we have a resident scholar on the podcast who we can refer to uh, in true. the great Stephanie Leahy, who is is meant to come on soon to talk about Dante Alighieri. I think oh, yeah, we actually have something in the calendar. Yeah, we uh, yeah. we'll have to yeah. we, uh, straight out of Cambridge. <laughs> Right. <laughs> He's a t-shirt. Straight yeah, out of right, Cambridge. Right, straight out of Cambridge. <laughs> straight out of my postdoc at Cambridge. <laughs> Stephanie, hello. Hope you're doing well. Yeah. yeah. Um, uh, a little bit further down, um, but, uh, Beast Wanger, the, this professor of this class, summed up O'Connor's position at the time. Quote, it was philosophical modernism that had blinded the Western mind. What most strong, what uh, registered most strongly was the certainty that he had before him no, uh, no ordinary girl quote she knew aquinas in detail and was amazingly well read in earlier philosophy and developed into her first rate intellectual along with her other accomplishments it soon became clear to me that she was a born writer and that she was going that way now a little bit further on this is not in this by swingers words a classic example of a teacher making a difference which is true i mean even if even if they disagreed. He apparently was stimulating this and encouraging it, right? So good on him for that at, at, a, at a minimum. Um, uh, Bayswanger encouraged his A student to apply for graduate school at his alma mater, the University of Iowa. She sent applications. Oh, hey, to that's, that's a good school. That is that's a good, good school. creative, right? The second greatest MFA program in the land. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Mm -hmm. That's right. Yeah. Um, uh, we're going to get to that. Yeah. Uh, the professor lobbied his contacts at Iowa to secure her a scholarship. When offered a journalism scholarship from Iowa, providing full tuition and seventy-five dollars a term, she quickly accepted. So she's going she's, to the mid best. She's coming out right. to the prairie. That's All right. right. Yeah. Good. Yeah. So you know, Kevin mentioned it. The second and their, best and their logo movie. is a fucking bird. How, about, how great that, could this that, be? That, that Incredible. must have been that must have sealed the deal, frankly. <laughs> she's she's looking through the 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 pamphlets. You right. fucking tell him y'all are hot guys. Right. This is awesome. Um, this is the best. <laughs> this rocks. Yeah, versus she also and applied I get to Duke. Paid? She oh. applied to Duke. Oh, so the devils or some kind of bird? That's <laughs> right. I'm, I'm going with the bird every time. <laughs> I um, literally went to Texas because I like the color orange. <laughs> It's a good, it's a good. Color. It's one of the reasons they we know each color. other, Red. Yeah, 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 that's true. Yeah, which, by the way, they they, from what I've heard, have the best MFA program up there. I, I, have, I have read that. Texas. I yeah. have read that. Yeah. Uh, so, so my next section here is Iowa. What do we know about Iowa and writers? Well, the Iowa Writers Workshop first started in 1936. Was the first dedicated program uh, for creative writing as an advanced degree in the United States the oldest writing program that offers a master's of fine arts in 1941 it was taken the over most by... embarrassing degree <laughs> <laughs> Dude, i love all the looks that you get all throughout life I, you know i have to admit like i yeah. i i had a great time there i <laughs> I, I had too. fun i learned a lot it was a great experience i wouldn't change it but i generally don't tell people that i did it <laughs> yeah, it it comes up. It comes up when it comes up. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. And uh, yeah. yeah, but it's an odd one. It's an odd mm -hmm. one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Um. So and anyway, this program 1941 was taken over by Paul Engel. If you want to hear more about the Iowa Writers Workshop and the history of the Iowa Writers Workshop is fascinating because there's connections to a certain three letter agency. Um, we did an episode on the American writer Dennis Johnson that's still behind a paywall, patreon.com slash art of dark pod, substack.com slash at art of dark pod. Um, you know, you gotta pay for that one. Uh, but you get all you get access to all the other great uh subscriber bonus exclusives and bonuses that you get. So it's worth it. We got a ton of stuff behind the paywall and mm -hmm. We're not going to belabor the appeal, but if you value what we do, especially these core episodes, consider chucking in five a month. It's easy. Mm -hmm. Patreon.com slash Art of Dark Pod. We appreciate all the support we get. Yeah. And in fact, um, paid subscribers are going to get access to an After Dark for this episode. And we're going to talk about two things, which are both fascinating. We're going to talk about a gentleman named Pierre Teilhard de Chardin, who people may know, French Jesuit, uh, French Jesuit priest and 
professor and I haven't heard that name in a long time. Ooh, huge influence on the late Flannery O'Connor. So we're going to talk about him and his ideas and what he what Flannery thought of him. And we're also going to talk about uh, the time that Flannery O'Connor went to a Marian uh, chapel in Italy to try and cure her lupus. Or sorry, in mm. the French Pyrenees to try and cure her her lupus. She also hmm. went to Italy, and we're going to talk about that. So if you sign up for the Patreon, you'll get that bonus content for this episode, and you will officially have zero days without Jesuit tricks in your life. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> That's true. Yep. Um, now, so now when Flannery went to Iowa, she didn't even know about the writer's workshop. This was just, hey, I this professor told me to go here. I got a scholarship. This sounds cool. I'm going to do it. She gets there and she finds out about this writer's workshop situation. And, you know, she's she's starting to take writing seriously. So this seems like a good idea. She goes to meet the director, Paul Engel. So she didn't get she didn't get into the writer's workshop. She went as for a journalism degree initially. She goes to meet the director, Paul Engel. And her Georgia accent is so thick that she has to write down on a piece of paper what she wants so he'll understand her. Right. You're going from the part of the country that has one of the thickest accents to the part of the country that is like the most neutral, middle, mm -hmm. beveled yeah. sound. Right. Yeah. You're yeah. going from the, the deep south to, Amer you know, American neutral, essentially. Right. Yeah. 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 It's like the average of all, all the accents and it's somehow everything. Most right, of and, stuff kind of falls and, out and, of it. It ended up be, being popularized by newscasters. So I think like uh, Tom Brokaw's from South Dakota, Cronkite mm -hmm. was from Ohio. So that sort of American middle accent took over um, around this mm -hmm. time. So yeah. very interesting. Yeah. People yeah. will still go. They'll still go get lessons to sound like us, <laughs> which is really <laughs> funny to think about. Yeah, Why? I apparently have I apparently have a Michigan accent, but I can't do hear you. It, so I don't know. I, don't I, just, know. I every time you say the word pit pitcher, pitcher. Yeah, pitcher. you don't say pick. You don't say pick, picture. Picture. Now, I don't know what the hell you guys are talking about? <laughs> nah, yeah, yeah. But it's, yeah. don't 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 overthink it. Don't overthink it. <laughs> well, here's the thing. It's like, what are you gonna, are you going to try to talk in a different no. manner? I, you know, I no. don't know. No. Um. Uh, so anyway, so I just thought this was charming. She goes in there, she tries to explain herself, and this guy's like, "I cannot. I don't know what you're saying to me." <laughs> that's a that's, that's incredible. <laughs> that's amazing. I love it. Well, of course she's going to yeah. be a writer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um. Now, uh, and interestingly enough, if you think about this too, the idea that Flannery was going to go up and go to the school all by herself was crazy her like there were some arguments and it was it was difficult for flannery to persuade her mother that she could do this and in fact the entire time she was at iowa she was walked home from class every night by fellow students like for the whole three years she was up there very like she came from a very sheltered existence and you know in that world a woman doesn't just go out and operate on her own fully without any support system right um Funny, interestingly enough, she packed a, she brought up to Iowa, she's a Georgia girl, right? She brought up to Iowa a 15 pound muskrat coat, expecting to be the winters to be sub zero, <laughs> which it, Iowa's it, cold. It, it gets cold. It's not Minnesota it cold. cold, but no, yeah, it's not it gets Minnesota cold. cold, but yeah. Um, and another thing about Iowa on day one at Iowa, she decided her name was Flannery, not Mary. They'd, she'd been called Mary, Mary, basically. I at that see. Point. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Interesting. Yeah. Now, she. Uh, this was 1945, and so she was on the scene uh, with a lot of World War II vets of one kind or another. Um, and in her first fiction workshop, she was one of I think I think there were two women in her fish, first fiction workshop, and she was one of them. Um, excuse me. I'm going to read a little bit from the biography here. Uh, if I can find my page, yeah. quote, O'Connor wrote about the shaky period in Iowa, trying to find her way as a writer for the alumni journal at Georgia State College for Women when the magazine was running a series on choices in career paths. Yeah, you could go be an eccentric writer up in the north and be corrupted by uh, by those people. Um, quote, in a piece titled uh, The Writer and Graduate School, which appeared in the summer of 1948, she confessed her initial doubts. 
What first stuns the young writer emerging from college is that there is no clear-cut road for him to travel on. He must chop a path in the wilderness of his own soul, a disheartening process, lifelong and lonesome. Therefore, of what use graduate work? Uh, she answered her own question with some of her um, arch high school humor by claiming that a creative writing program at least saved a few authentic writers from becoming one of those uh, the scholarly, quote, dead birds in the literary woods. Uh, reading down the page a little bit, quote, some of these were laid away with PhDs and doubtless all with an excellent knowledge of Beowulf. The MFA program was an alternative, she concluded, to, quote, the poor house and the madhouse. So... <laughs> Oh, she understood exactly what an MFA program was. There, there, like eighty years well, ago. She, one she of them. Its number. <laughs> I always say, don't pay for an MFA. I always right. say that. Now you know your own circumstances. If you're yeah. different people, but definitely mm -hmm. try not to pay for one. And mm -hmm. it can be a good place to hide out for three or four years. You go yeah. and hide. Oh, sure. You kind of hide out. Yeah. <laughs> And yeah, yeah, that alone for a, a writer has some benefit. Yeah, I think, you know, it, it, I think I have mixed feelings about the utility of it. I think I think on the whole, it's good. I mean, you learn a lot. You get time to write, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You have to unlearn some of the things that you learn, but you also get put in touch with material that you wouldn't otherwise. On the whole, it's good. But the one thing I think for guys like you and I, Kevin, that, that maybe really resonates here is she says, uh, what is it? Um, there is no clear cut road for the writer to travel on. Right. And in the right. MFA, the MFA kind of can, um, trick you into thinking that there's like a straight line path to this somehow. Right. And there, there no. just isn't. Yeah. No, there isn't. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And so when you find out that there and even if there even if yeah. there was, we wouldn't want it. That's no, the problem. No. You think well, you right. want that, but you, you wouldn't right. even want that. So right. it's very. Right. Yeah, because yeah. yeah. you become right. like what she's saying. You 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 risk becoming um, a dead bird in the literary woods laid away with PhDs and, ex and an excellent knowledge of Beowulf. That's the that's the flip. Mm. That's the other risk. Right. So now she was she was an odd duck at uh, at Iowa. Not only because of her Georgia di uh, her Georgia dialect, which was treated like it was almost a foreign language, um, she also used the hard R N word in her stories, which people either overlooked or they modified. They tried to coach her into saying Negro, um, but according to her, quote, the people I was writing about would never use any other word. So. Uh, it's probably true too. I feel like we can on this episode. I feel like we can swap in Negro. Can we do that? Yeah. Can we agree on yeah. that middle ground? Yeah, yeah. I think so. Okay. I'm not gonna. I'm Great. not gonna drop. I'm not yeah. gonna drop the hard. Hey, hard if it's R good word enough, sure. uh, no, of course not. Yeah. But if if it's good enough for the Iowa Writers Workshop in the 40s, right? <laughs> it's right. good right. enough. Right. It's good enough for well, this podcast. Yeah, and this is all yeah. historical context here. Sure. Um. Now, yeah, we take we, we take no pleasure in in yeah yeah. So yeah, yeah. of course. And, and this is a time, this is probably the appropriate time in the episode to talk about the question of Flannery O'Connor's racism. Okay. Uh, <laughs> the vapor, the vapors. Right, I've got right. a, oh, and, and yeah. it could just a, a thousand articles in the Atlantic yeah, all yeah. dropped at once. Yeah. 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 Now, right. And this whole discourse probably comes to its head in a, 2020 New Yorker article, article entitled "How Racist Was Flannery O'Connor?" It's the name of the article. You gotta, you gotta give them some credit for just going right directly. To the Put the cards bait. on the table. It's just right? this is this is who we are yeah. now, and we yeah. are we are the Monocle magazine with the mm -hmm. with the readily identifiable font that has completely yeah. gone to shit over the years. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and yeah. we're going to yeah. let you know who we yeah. are now. Yeah. yeah. It's yeah. like for real. Yeah. And you, and here's the thing. And, and I'm not going to try and convince you that Flannery O'Connor wasn't racist to some degree. This is not the point that I'm, that I am trying to convince this audience of, but with this article, I did get the sense of like the image that flashed to my head was just a reporter just falling through space and just like grabbing onto the word Flannery O'Connor's a racist, just like, <laughs> like you know what I mean? Just like right. how, somebody, how somebody racist click on this was link. this? Yeah, how <laughs> racist was this 
Catholic woman from the South who was born in the 20s. Right, right. Let's exactly. write and read all about it. Because <laughs> right, that's right. what matters right, right, right now. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So we're going to talk about it a little bit because I feel like we kind of have to, but let's we'll 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 try to we'll try to move through it fairly quickly <sighs> she was prejudiced against black people okay this this is this is true uh she in le- letters to her friend you know, basically going to say how w- what was the extent of this or what was the nature of this in letters to her friend Marriott letter uh lee um she would often share the latest black jokes that she'd heard okay um, she was once on public transit transportation in New York and she moved so she wouldn't sit next to a black person. I don't know what that means. Maybe, maybe she didn't like sitting next to anybody who knows. Um, she, uh, she was gener- she was appa- supposedly upset when she saw black students integrated at Columbia university. Um, we don't get a lot of evidence that she really You know, I think intellectually. Well, okay. well, here's one thing we do know when she lived with her mother later in life and she would have more sophisticated literary type friends come over. She would try and keep them away from her mother because it was about 15 minutes before her mother started saying something racist. Oh, God. (laughs) So you have like a you have like a publisher from New York. That's that. That's passion. Sure, that's not going to work. <laughs> you're you're yeah. like, uh, let's oh. let's uh, let's go into the parlor. It's really not. It's so strange. It's really not in the spirit of Catholicism either, mm-hmm. which is universal. So yeah, mm-hmm. I mean, you know, I, I'm and I'm not holier than thou, but yeah, I mean, I, yeah, yeah, different. I time. think a lot of it, uh, uh, different times. I mean, a lot of it is a lot of a lot of it isn't even so much out and out racism to me as it is like parochialism. It's just like. Mm just the kind of an you've, we've lived in this very fairly circumscri- circumscribed environment and everything outside of it is uh weird to you right yeah and i, I think it's also um, a, how you how they define themselves we're not that yeah. we're this and you're right. gonna know it and yeah. probably some like a uh, degree of status insecurity and yeah uh, there's that yeah. too yeah yeah, yeah. now the family did have black people working for them at various times um Apparently, some of them were very devoted to the o- to the O'Connors. Um, I think I think intellectually, the quote biggest you know the biggest quote crime of Flannery Co- Flannery O'Connor was her attitude towards James Baldwin. Now I'm going to read a little bit about this. Excuse me. Um, I think this is from a letter Flannery wrote in uh, 1964. So this is if uh, you know 20 years from the point in the story we're in now. But quote <clears throat> about the Negroes. The kind I don't like is the philosophizing, prophesizing, pontificating kind, the James Baldwin kind. Very ignorant, but never silent. Baldwin can tell us what it feels like to be a Negro in Harlem, but he tries to tell us everything else, too. ML King, I don't think, is the age's great saint, but he's at least doing what he can do and has to do. Don't know anything about Ossie Davis, except that you like him. Um... Uh, a little bit later, my question is usually, would this person be endurable if white? If Baldwin were white, nobody would stand him a minute. Um, I prefer. Damn. Cash. Yeah. How do you really so, feel? Right. Um, she says, uh, I prefer Cassius Clay. Quote, if a tiger move it moves into the room with you, says Cassius, and you leave, that doesn't mean you hate the tiger. Just means, you know, you just means you know you and him can't make out too there's too much talk about hate and then flannery says cassius is too good for the muslims um so yeah listen listen i know you probably have strong feelings about flannery now audience but hey this is yeah. a this is a, a strong independent woman with her own mind so i mean you've got that factor we don't yeah. we don't play identity politics olympics no. on this podcast we just try to kind of report and well, give you well, a full picture of a character yeah yeah well i mean this is this is part of the thing is we're trying to understand who this person is who is this person that could write those two pages i read at the beginning what is, what is the full neighborhood or solar system of their mind? This is in there too. So, um, yeah. Um, a little bit later, uh, she said in a letter, um, apparently somebody had suggested that James Baldwin come visit her 
in in Milledgeville. And she said, quote, no, I can't see James Baldwin in Georgia. It would cause the greatest trouble and disturbance and disunion. In New York, it would be nice to meet him. Here it would not. I observe the traditions of the society I feed on. It's only fair. Might as well expect a mule to fly as to me as me to see James Baldwin in Georgia. I have read one of his stories and it was a good one. So um hmm. there are um racial situations, I guess, in her and they're black characters in some of her stories. Um there's the black staff of the farm that serves uh, as the central setting in the enduring chill. Um that's a great story for people who haven't read it. Um for these characters, I think it's hard to imagine any kind of accusation of racism sticking because these characters are just sort of there. They're not, they don't really do anything. They, they're, and, 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 and also not in a negative way, not in a like, they don't do anything way. That's that they, their function in the, in the plot is very circumstantial. Um, there are, uh, blacks uh, a family of black people who live near the backwood shack in uh the violent the bear it away in that story that family is like the only sane people in the entire book so i don't think you can really say much from that um and then in her 1961 story everything that rises that rises must converge from which the title of which she got gets from the thinking of um pierre tailhard de chaudin um, we get what O'Connor calls all she has to say on that issue. And she capitalized that an issue talking about race. Um, let's le- read a little bit about this. And this is actually from that New Yorker article. It's a kind of a quick summary of everything that rises and must converge. Uh, quote, a white man living at home after college takes his mother to reducing class, which is what you used to call it when women went to a thing to try and lose weight on a newly integrated city bus. The sight of an African-American woman wearing the same style of hat that his mother is wearing stirs him to reflect on all that joins them. The sight of a black boy in the woman's company prompts his mother to give the boy a gift, a penny with Lincoln's profile on it. Things get grim after that. In this story, Everything That Rises Must Converge, we get a very typical Flannery O'Connor setup, which is um, an old school southern mother and a intellectual but disaffected and ill-fitting child and we can always assume that that one is flannery and the other one's her mother but she's also kind of in her mother too right it's a little bit of a little bit of both um uh i think you know I, 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 my read of this story is it's about race but i don't see how you would read it and um think it's flannery trying to say anything racist um uh i guess somebody probably could and as they always tend to but um i think (laughs) i think there's a well let me just read a part of it um this is everything that rises must converge uh Really, a, really a strong, and this is a later story. I think it was written in 1961, so it's kind of at the back, you know, the back half of her career. Um, yeah. Um, quote: The old lady was clever enough, and he thought that if she had started from any of the right premises, more might have been expected of her. This is uh, Julian, to sort of stand in for Flannery, talking about Julian, his his mother, which would be the stand in for Flannery's mother. Quote, she lived according to the laws of her own fantasy world, outside of which she had never seen her set foot. The law of it was to sacrifice herself for him after she had first created the uh, necessity to do so by making a mess of things. If he had permitted her sacrifices, it was only because her lack of foresight had made them necessary. All of her life had been a struggle to act like a chesney without the chesney goods. And that's their, the family, and this is the chesneys, right? Uh, and to give him everything she thought a chesney ought to have. Uh, but since said he, it was fun to struggle. Why complain? And when you had won as she, as she had won, what fun to look back on the hard times. He could not forgive her that she had enjoyed the struggle and that she thought she had won. <clears throat> what she meant when, uh, she said she had won was that she had brought him up successfully and had sent him to college and that he had turned out so well, good looking, intelligent, and with a future ahead of him. There was of course no future ahead of him. She excused his gloominess on the grounds that he was still growing up and his radical ideas on his lack of practical experience. 
She said he didn't yet know a thing about life, that he didn't, uh, hadn't even entered the real world when already he was as disenchanted with it as a man of 50. The further irony of all this was that in spite of her, he had turned out so well. In spite of going to only a third-rate college, he had, on his own initiative, come out with a first-rate education. In spite of growing up dominated by small minds, he had ended up with a large one. In spite of all her foolish views, he was free of prejudice and unafraid to face facts. Most miraculous of, it all, of all, instead of being blinded by love for her as she was for him, he had cut himself emotionally free of her and could see her with complete objectivity. He was not dominated by his mother. The bus stopped with a sudden jerk and shook him from meditation. A woman from the back lurched forward with little steps and barely escaped falling into his newspaper, falling in his newspaper as she righted herself. She got off and a large Negro got on. Julian kept his paper lowered to watch. It gave him a certain satisfaction to see an injustice in daily operation. It confirmed his view that with a few exceptions, there was no one worth knowing within a radius of 300 miles. The Negro was well-dressed and carried a briefcase. He looked around and then sat down on the other end of the seat where the woman with the red and white canvas sandals was sitting. He immediately unfolded a newspaper and obscured himself behind it. Julian's mother's uh, elbow at once prodded insistently into his ribs. Now you see why I don't ride on these buses by myself, she whispered. So, um, yeah, that's a little bit of that story. Um, now, another story in, that somebody might apply the term racist to is a story called the artificial Negro, though that's not the word Flannery used. This is uh, from 1955. Uh, it's a story. Uh, it's in the collection. A good man is hard to find. Um, in this story, the character, excuse me, the character, Mr. Head, who lives in the Georgia countryside with his grandson, Nelson, takes the boy on a train for his first visit to the city of Atlanta. Excuse me. The trip does not go well. Uh, Nelson <laughs> Uh, Nelson sees his first black person uh, and they eventually get lost in the less impressive uh, black do dominated side of the city where Mr. Head will not ask anyone for directions. It's pretty humorous. Um, it's pretty humorous because it's like one of these situations where like Mr. Head is terrified. And but as, as a reader, you can see that like the monsters are all in his head, right? Like he's freaked out because he's He's from the middle of nowhere and he's suddenly in the city and he's, you know, he's freaking himself out. None of it's actually scary or dangerous right, at all. Right. Um, uh, let's see. Uh, do, 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 okay. So every, oh, and then everybody also there, everybody treats them fine. Right. He's like, they're scared of like, Mr. Head is like scared of all these black people and he's, he's concerned that something's going to happen to them, but everybody treats them fine. There's one woman they ask for directions and she's like slightly condescending, but not in any kind of like aggressive way or anything. It all goes, all of the problems are of their own making fundamentally. Eventually they stumble into a well-to-do well neighborhood and the title comes from the fact that in one of these yards is a statue. Um, I was going to read about that, but there is a bit of an epiphany that they kind of have at the end. Um, I guess my whole point in, in pointing all this out is that I think Flannery did have some view, some some racist racist views, prejudiced views. I think she was probably more, I guess, progressive is the word than other people she was surrounded by, and I think she did try to think through these things in her writing. I guess is sort of my takeaway on this. Um, so yeah, um, I do want to read quickly from the biography a little bit on this. <clears throat> and then one piece from the New Yorker article, and then we'll move on from this subject. Um, yeah, you know, it's, it's again, it's, it's sort of something that I guess I felt like we needed to talk about or that we couldn't totally ignore, but I don't know. Um, a, uh, this is a quote from a Conyers monk, a, the Conyers, Conyers was a monastery in Georgia that she, um, later in life, Flannery had some relationship with, <clears throat> um, and this monk says, quote, I would call Flannery a cultural racist. It wasn't that she didn't know they were children of God redeemed by the blood of Christ. Of course she knew that. 
but the vocabulary she used was typical Southern white. Um, I, uh, according to Paul, who is another person uh, uh, associated with the Conyers, um, I never heard her. Her mother was worse. Flannery tempered at some. She did not hate black people, but she did resent the whiteies from the North coming down and telling us how to handle all of our problems. Um, there's another thing from her New York editor or a New York editor quote, she never said anything racist, but she was patronizing about blacks, treating them as children. When I was introduced to black workers on the farm, they would take off their hats. I was both a white man and a priest. So they were doing double duty. Uh, O'Connor's position basically fell close to William, William Faulkner's. And that was that segregation was an evil according to Faulkner, but if integration were forced upon the South, he would resist. Uh, in his personal life, his behavior toward African Americans was always cordial and kind, but as one writer uh, has characterized it, it was also patronizing. He belonged, after all, to a patron class. So, okay. Um, from the New Yorker article. Um, quote, the context arguments go like this. O'Connor was a writer of her place and time, and her limitations were those of, quote, the culture that had produced her. Forced by illness to return to Georgia, she was made captive to a Southern code of manners that maintained white superiority over blacks, but her fiction subjects the code to scrutiny. Although she used racial epithets carelessly in her correspondence, she dealt with race courageously in the fiction, depicting white characters pitilessly and creating upstanding black characters who, quote, retain an inviolable privacy. And this is the part that I, this is the part of this article that I think is weird. So listen to this. The article says, and she was, admir uh, Flannery was admir admirably leery of cultural appropriation, saying uh, to an interviewer, quote, I don't feel capable of entering the mind of a Negro. So <laughs> there's this, like, there's a part that, um, <laughs> I, the part that I think is the mo is 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 racist about Flannery. She says I I don't understand what's going on in their heads. They're like a different thing than I am. And the New Yorker piece is like, well, at least she wasn't appropriating their culture. I was like, I think that's the like that's the weirdest part of her whole racial perspective is that like she thinks she can't understand how their mind works. Well, it, it, but this is it, right? It's a, it's a catch 22, all of this stuff. If right. you, if you tr say that you can understand and empathize, then you're appropriating. If you f say, right. no, it's a little too alien, then you're a bigot and you're, you lack emotional empathy. You can't win. It's you, can't, uh, you right. just can't win either way. I mean, and that's, right. that's how they, and it's all this is all fugazi. There's no there's right. no real uh, you know ideological underpinning to any of this except right. vibes. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. No. Right. So anyway, we're gonna move off of that. Um, we're gonna talk about the fact that she rapidly became a very competent writer. Um. Uh. So let's see. Um. And this is at Iowa. We're back in these early days at I Iowa Iowa Writers Workshop. Um. She's a quick study. And um, even despite the fact that, you know, her kind of Southern, she, she is, she doesn't fit in all that well. It doesn't take very long before, you know, people start to pay attention to her as a writer at Iowa. Um, uh, and I, I think this is the, I'm, I don't think I'm going to recount it. There, There is a, I'm, I don't think I'm going to read it. There is this funny bit though, because she's, she's from the South. She's very religious. And we have to remember she's had basically no experience, uh, romantic experiences at all. And I, I don't mean sexual. I mean, she's never been on a date, right? She's never been courted by a boy at all. There's, there's, there's literally nothing has happened for, on the romantic front. And, and, um, she would, she would remain, you know, she was, she was devout. And so she, and she never married. And so she would never have sex. But even at this point, like she had never, she had never like, again, she had like never gone to the movies with a boy. Right. So it's, it's, it's a level beyond just, you know, she never had those, those youthful experiences of, you know, fumbling around with her brassiere or whatever. Um, and there's a story she writes at the Iowa Writers Workshop, apparently where she like depicts some intimate situation between a boy and a girl. And Paul Engel, the director who is um, uh, leading the class, had to like take her aside and be like, Flannery, listen, um, it's not really how it works. 
So like, I don't know the details, but like he literally had to go, they went and sat in his car and he explained some very basic aspects of like men and women physical relations so that she could write this story <laughs> because she like literally didn't know. How do you go from like sitting on one side of the room from opposite sides of the room to like having sex? How does. Sure, sure, she, sure. She didn't know any of those steps. Along ah, the way. <laughs> ah, she's, uh, she's learning about the chickens and the bees, the chickens right. and the bees. That's right. I, I just, think we got, I just, we got a show title. Yeah. <laughs> Might. Um, and, and, you know, and there is a thing she starts to run into this thing and, and partially because of conversations with Paul Engel about, well, as a, if I'm a good Catholic, should I even be doing this writing thing? Like, is this OK? Like, this is a struggle that she was having. Right. Should I be, you know, would, would the proper thing to be like carving icons? Like, how how should I hold my faith and my my art together how do i make these things work right and i think that's a reasonable conundrum for anybody it's not an uncommon problem for catholic artists uh Mm -hmm. and for religious people for religious artists Mm -hmm. what am i doing here yeah right Mm -hmm. right and i i think she never really figured it out until a little bit later it took some years for her to really kind of come to terms with all this and it came from a couple sources one was uh, the novels of a french writer um uh, moriac um the novel in english it's called lines of life in particular in particular and then the writings of a of another frenchman named uh, jacques maritain um particularly a book called art and scholasticism and the frontiers of poetry and i'm just going to read a couple passages from that book that i think probably helped Flannery figure out who she was as a Catholic who was an artist who wasn't making, um, what would the word be, overtly Christian. I mean, the themes are all there, but it's not, it, it's, it's not, she's not writing um, the literary version of Christian, Christian rock music. This is not what she's doing, right? Um, okay. So this is from Jacques What, is, what is it? <laughs> what is, what's the line from... Uh uh from uh, king of the hill you're not making oh. christianity better you're making rock and roll worse <laughs> right right exactly <laughs> exactly <laughs> yes yes heavy yeah, metal for jesus right 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 mm. right right and the flannery was trying how to figure out how to like right how to not make literature worse but you know yeah right yeah, so, there's room yeah. for different things. There's room yeah, for different. Of course, things. Yeah. of course. Now, again, a couple things from this Jack Maritain book. I, I I find this book very interesting. And if somebody out there is an artist who is um, religious and is trying to navigate that labyrinth, um, this might be a, a book you might want to check out. Um, quote. But it may be objected: Is not this Christian art a myth? Can one even conceive of it? Is not art pagan by birth and tied to sin just as man is a sinner by birth? But grace heals wounded nature. Do not say that a Christian art is impossible. Say rather that it is difficult, doubly difficult, fourfold difficult, because it is difficult to be an artist and very difficult to be a Christian. And because the total difficulty is not simply the sum, but the product of these two difficulties multiplied by one another. For it is a question of harmonizing two absolutes. Say that the difficulty becomes tremendous when the entire age lives far from Christ, for the artist is greatly dependent on the spirit of his time. But has courage ever been lacking on the earth? A little bit uh, different passage. Quote, if you want to make a Christian work, then be Christian and simply try to make a beautiful work into which your heart will pass. Do not try to make it Christian. Uh, Another part. Do not make the absurd attempt to dissociate in yourself the artist and the Christian. They are one if you are truly Christian. And if your art is not isolated from your soul by some system of aesthetics, but apply only the artist to the work precisely because the artist and the Christian are one, the work will derive wholly from each of them. Now a little bit later. Art teaches men the delectations of the spirit, and because it is itself sensible and adapted to their nature, it can best lead them to what is nobler than itself. It thus plays in nat- in natural life the same role, so to speak, as the sensible graces in the spiritual life. And from very far and unconsciously, it prepares the human race for contemplation, the contemplation of the saints, whose spiritual delectation exceeds all delectation, and which seems to be the end of all operations of men. Uh, and for people who don't know, I had to look up delectation. I wasn't sure. That means delight, basically, right? 
for why the sir uh for why the servile works and trade if not in order that the body being provided with the necessaries of life may be in the state required for contemplation why the moral virtues and prudence if not to procure the tranquility of the passions and the interior peace that contemplation needs why the whole government of civil life if not to assure the exterior peace necessary to contemplation Quote, so that properly considered all the functions of human life seem to be for the service of those who contemplate truth, but contemplation itself is for the sake of love. Anyway, I'm not going to recapitulate all of that. She was at her time in Iowa was beginning to understand a few things about her faith and her art. And one thing that was major, and we might touch on this again later, is she realized that she had a gift. And she also realized that that gift did not come from her. It had been given to her. And for her to not see it out, play it out, would have been uh, an act of, of uh, apostasy it's a in a it's way. A sin. And a sin. Right. Yeah. It's, it's, it, it, is, it is, I think, I don't know what the official position of the church is on this, but mm-hmm. if, you, if you were given a gift uh, and you don't, you don't use it for your mm-hmm. fellows... That that is, it does feel like a sin, doesn't it? It feels mm-hmm. like a waste. It does. Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. and that's that's a good motivation too. If you feel like you have a gift at something, don't uh, don't selfishly keep it to yourself. Like, give it away. Really, yeah. Yeah. really. Yeah. yeah, that's a beautiful yeah. thing. It really is. It really yeah. is. And so, yeah. So that that was part of her maturing process in this whole thing, right? Because again, we have to think at this when she's having this little sort of mini crisis. And again, it's not a crisis of faith. It's a it's a crisis of it's not her faith wavering. It's her uncertainty about what she does having that faith is really what the nature of the crisis is. But she's she's 20, 21 years old. She's figuring all this out. Um. She gets pretty quickly published in Accent magazine, which was an important journal at the time. Uh, This is uh, 1946. And she's starting to meet writers the way one does at a prestigious MFA program. Robert Penn Warren uh, is one writer who she met who, you know, kind of picked her work out of a pile of them and, and, and thought it was quite good. Robert Penn Warren, for people who don't know, very important Southern writer. Um, and, uh, yeah, well, we might talk a little bit more about the the the, the agrarians. Um, she was taught by John Crow Ransom, very important Southern poet. Um, and importantly for Flannery, she was in a class with the cream of the crop of her sort of generation of writers, and she started to understand that she was very, very good at this. Not in any kind of egomaniacal way, but just in a like, oh, like I was good at Georgia. I was good at, you know, Georgia College for Women, but I'm here with, these are supposed to be the best people, and I'm as good as any of them, right? And that's a very encouraging moment to have. Um, Around Christmas of 1946, Flannery begins work on what she thinks will be a short story. This is entitled The Train, and over the next few years, it would become the opening chapter of Wise Blood. She also found herself under the wing of Andrew Lytle, who for uh, people who maybe don't know, was associated with the Southern Agrarians. This is a group of 12 American Southern writers who had been based out of Vanderbilt in the 1930s. So there's Lytle, there's Robert Penn Warren, there's John Crow Ransom, who Flannery took classes from. There's a guy named Alan Tate um, and a variety of others. These are heavies in the Southern Renaissance. When we now we think of, oh, the Southern literature is like a phenomena. Um, it goes back to Poe and earlier, but there was a big moment, um, uh, a, a big moment in the thirties and Faulkner was sort of associated with this as well, though he wasn't one of the quote unquote Southern agrarians. Um, these were the heavies of that Renaissance. Um, and this group of 12, the Southern, Southern agrarians, um, I don't know if anybody talks about this now, but they they had a publication which was basically a manifesto of Southern writing. We love a good manifesto. <laughs> it was called manifesto on the pod. You yeah. got a manifesto <laughs> on the pod for your hit, bingo cards. Yeah, hit I, that I bingo card. You know, you know, hit that yeah. bingo card. Yeah, manifesto yeah. spotted. We love yeah. a manifesto on yeah. our darkness. Yeah, this is one yeah. you can buy a copy of. You can go on to a Libri and buy a copy of this. It's called "I'll Take My Stand." And yeah. each each one of the Southern agrarians contributed an essay to this thing. Um, I, I'm going to read just a little bit about it because this is interesting and not because Flannery contributed to it, but she was 
she was like the adopted daughter of the Southern agrarians. Like every one of the Southern agrarian agrarians she ran into in her writing career loved her and did everything they could to help her. So she was sort of like, again, she was like the adopted talent of the next generation of Southern agrarians. Um, okay. This is just from Wikipedia, but just to give you a sense of what this, I'll take my stand thing is and why any of this might matter. Um, <clears throat> quote, I'll take my stand was criticized at the time and since as a reactionary and romanticized defense of the old South and the lost cause of the Confederacy. Um, interestingly enough, lost cause of the Confederacy is a blue link on Wikipedia might be interesting to look at. Um, but we're not going to go into it here. Uh, I'll take my stand ig supposedly ignored pro uh, slavery and denounced progress. And some critics considered it to be moved by m nostalgia. A key quote, um, I think this is by Robert Penn Warren. This is a key quote. <clears throat> and it's from the introduction to I'll Take My Stand. Quote, all the articles bear in the same sense upon the book's title subject. All tend to support a Southern way of life against what may be called the American or prevailing way. And all as much as agree that the best terms in which to represent the distinction are contained in the phrase agrarian versus industrial. Opposed to the industrial society is the agrarian, which does not stand in particular need of definition. An agrarian society is hardly one that has no use at all for industries, for professional vocations, for scholars and artists, and for the life of cities. Technically, perhaps, an agrarian society is one in which agriculture is the leading vocation, whether for wealth, pleasure, or prestige, a form of labor that is pursued with intelligence and leisure and that becomes the model to which other forms approach as well as they may. But an agrarian, agrarian regime will be secured readily enough where the superfluous industries are not allowed to rise against it. The theory of agrarianism is that the culture of the soil is the best and most sensitive of vocations and that therefore it should have the economic preference and enlist the maximum number of workers. Um, so, okay. <clears throat> uh, yeah, make of that what you will. Um, I think in one way they're, they're advocating for something that people on the internet sometimes refer to as a, uh, what is it? A high, high trust, low density way of life. I think that's, a, I think that's part of this, right? Um, uh, let's see. So through these relationships with, uh, people like Andrew Lytle and others, um, Flannery ends up winning a Reinhardt Iowa award, um, for a very, very, very early manuscript of wise blood. And this gets her a $750 advance. That's those days dollars. And she gets the promise of potential publication sort of dangled in front of her, which is always exciting. Um, her final year at Iowa, she pretty much just worked. Like she got dead focused on trying to write this book. She had a little apartment. She lived in very simple, very simple uh, situation, uh, living mostly on vanilla wafers, supposedly. <laughs> Um, she did go on a few outings with this guy named, uh, uh, Roby, uh, Macaulay. Um, and then in 1947, she's introduced to Robert Lowell, the great American poet who would become a very useful friend later on. Uh, Flannery graduates. She spends another year at Iowa on a fellowship and then she's off to Yaddo for the summer of 1948. <laughs>